Meanwhile, in publishing news, Josh Brolin wrote a bunch of poems for a behind-the-scenes Dune book, including one about Timothy Chalamet's cheekbones. <laughs> that is absolutely beautiful, Josh. Bravo. <laughs> Timothy Chalamet responded with a poem of his own. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm going to call HR on you. So, as Super Bowl Sunday came to a close, I opened up Reddit to find a poem by Josh Brolin on r slash poetry. Not long after discovering this poem's existence, I realized that Brolin was making headlines for it. Multiple outlets were reporting on this poem as it caused a bit of a stir. Part of the poem's virality no doubt came from its subject matter, Timothy Chalamet, one of the most presently discussed actors in the world, especially by the rising generations. Moreover, responses to the poem were perhaps more discussed than the poem itself. Here, before we go any further, let me just read the poem. Your face is etched by adolescence. Your cheekbones jump toward what are youth-laden eyes that slide down a prominent nose and onto lips of a certain poetry. And the way you hold my gaze makes me fear my own age. Because something in me tells me you are going to offer me something and, for now, I'm not sure it's going to be something I want anymore. So perhaps you can already see why this poem created a lot of discussion online. For one thing, and there's really no other way to say this, but as the poem is written, it sounds like Timothy Chalamet is propositioning Josh Brolin for sex. So that on its own came off as funny. Beyond that, however, a lot of people were commenting negatively on the poem's merit. In describing the poem's quality, Redditors used descriptors such as terrible, clunky, awkward, cringy, awful, high school freshman level, rupee core level, and just simply bad. That said, the poem still had its fans. One Redditor called it delightful, with others agreeing. And one of the most upvoted comments in the discussion asked, Why so much hate? Why shouldn't poetry be fun? In reply, another user wrote, Couldn't agree more. Expression of the human spirit isn't predicated on sophistication or literary techniques. Someone else then replied, Yes, expression of the human spirit, whatever, but a poem has to be good, too. To which another user said, A poem doesn't have to be anything. As you might already be able to tell, this discussion piqued my interest. Not only did the poem itself catch my eye due to the celebrity author and subject matter, but beyond that, so did the question of whether art has to justify its own existence. Does a poem have to be good? Does it have to be anything? Now, I'm just gonna come out and say it, I don't like this poem. I think that was pretty clear from the video's title. So what does that make me? A curmudgeon? Someone who hates art and expression? A gatekeeper of poetry? Maybe. But if I've made one thing clear on my channel, it's that I love to analyze poetry, good or bad. So let's meet Brolin on his own terms. We'll give his poem a fair shake by analyzing it with all the seriousness of an English literature class. When it comes to modern literary criticism, a lot of us get bogged down by personal preference, hence Brolin's defenders on Reddit. And don't get me wrong, there is a place for preference in review. All critics have biases, and it's good to understand those biases when reading a review. That said, we should not conflate personal preference with more objective literary criticism. For example, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot is a highly celebrated poem. Classrooms continue analyzing this work to this day because of its apparent depth, forethought, and skill. That said, I do not like this poem based solely on personal preference. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there's this poem here by Sam Pink. This poem, consisting of four lines and 19 words, clearly isn't dripping with technical depth, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't like it. And even though it's certainly not Eliot, the poem still gives the reader a few things to consider. So with all of this in mind, I thought analyzing Brolin's poem would be a good way to discuss its merits, whether it's worthy of criticism and what I dislike about it. Moreover, much like when we analyzed Taylor Swift's work in the song lyrics video, I want this to be a lesson in how to analyze a poem. So for Brolin's work, we'll once again be using the tips fast method. That stands for title, paraphrase, speaker, figurative language, including structural techniques, attitude, shifts, title revisited, and theme. And right before we jump into it, keep just one more thing in mind. There are plenty of substantive poems that are still bad. A poem can be overflowing with depth and technique, but can still get bogged down, either by improper usage, a lack of subtlety, a lack of direction, or any other myriad of problems. Poetry is both intentional and complicated, and lots of things can go wrong in the execution. 
One of the most famous examples would be the Tay Bridge disaster by William McGonagall, an author widely considered to be the worst poet of all time. The Tay Bridge disaster is a lengthy poem that employs rhythm, rhyme, imagery, illusion, symbolism, and historical context. But despite all these devices coming together, this poem is just bad. A lot of the lines read as awkward or unnecessary, especially with the unimpressive repetition, and ultimately, my biggest problem with the poem is that it just doesn't have anything to say. Or rather, what it does have to say is so vapid. Like, sorry to be digressing here, I promise we will get to Brolin in a minute. But the Taybridge disaster of 1879 was a real event in which a train fell from a collapsing bridge in the middle of a tropical storm. 75 people lost their lives, not 90 like the poem states, and the tragedy shocked the nation. So what was McGonagall's takeaway from the travesty? To quote the last two lines of the poem, For the stronger we our houses do build, the less chance we have of being killed. Like, what? That's it? That's the message that this poem has been building to? Where's that gif from Community? Anyway, sorry about that tangent. All of that is to say, technique does not necessarily translate to good poetry. So, with that, let's get into our analysis. Title. As you can see, this poem has no title. When that's the case, we have a couple of options. We could take the first line to be the title, or we could prescribe a title based on the subject matter. For example, we might title this poem Timothy Chalamet. However, these choices ultimately might misconstrue our analysis, so we'll just skip this part of the dissection, along with the revisitation of the title that we'd normally do at the end of our analysis. Paraphrase. Here's my paraphrasing of Brolin's poem. Drawn on your face is youth. Your cheekbones lunge near your young eyes that slide down a noticeable nose to lips like a lyric. When you lock eyes with me, I confront how old I am. Because something inside me says you will have an offer for me, but I don't know if I want to accept it at this point. You'll notice that a good portion of my paraphrase didn't actually change the language Brolin used. In general, the paraphrase portion of the analysis is meant to help us understand what's literally happening in the context of the poem. However, Brolin's poem is written in such simple language that it doesn't take much deciphering. And granted, poems written in plain language aren't necessarily bad. It would be a gross overgeneralization to say such a thing. Still, the fact that our paraphrase doesn't differ much from the actual poem might be an indication of the poem's depth. Speaker. Based on our outside context, we know the poem is meant to be Josh Brolin speaking directly to his audience, Timothy Chalamet. However, if we divorce this poem from all outside context and take it only on its face, the only thing we really know about the speaker is that they consider themselves old. For the rest of the analysis, we don't need to know much besides that. Figurative language. Remember, this should be the longest portion of the analysis since, in general, poems are clusters of figurative language. On top of that, we're also analyzing poetic techniques separate from the language, like punctuation and structure. Starting with the first two lines, the word etched suggests certain delineations over the subject's face, features that appear printed or coded, particularly with fine craftsmanship. In the second stanza, the subject's cheekbones are subtly personified as they're said to jump upward. This language further paints the picture of the aforementioned etched features. In the next line, we're introduced to the youth-laden eyes, hearkening back to the adolescence. The eyes slide down in opposition to the cheekbones that jump. Next, we're introduced to a prominent nose and lips of a certain poetry. The description of the lips as poetry suggests artfulness in their form. In the third stanza, hold my gaze is a turn of phrase that, of course, means maintaining eye contact. It also suggests some control that the subject has over the speaker. The fourth stanza doesn't contain much figurative language as it's quite literal, but despite the lack of literary devices, there is a sense of vagueness, which we will come back to later. There is one interesting thing to note about this stanza. The words going to, now, and any more all suggest a relationship between the future, present, and past, respectively. Attitude. There are a few words we can use to describe the attitude here. Melancholic, uneasy, existentialist. At the beginning of the poem, there's a more praising tone, and by the end of the poem, the tone could read as envious. Shifts. The major shift comes in line 7 when the speaker announces their fear. 
As I mentioned, up until that point the tone seemed praiseworthy. There's also a noticeable shift after line 9 as the lines become much shorter after that point, with more abundant breaks between words. Title revisited. Again, no title. Theme. Remember, theme is never one word. Another term we could use to describe theme is the moral of the story. Ergo, what is the poem trying to say? I wrote down three similar themes, those being 1. Things fall apart, 2. Youth fades, and 3. People change. Things fall apart is a very common theme across all of literature, so common that Chinua Achebe wrote a book called Things Fall Apart. It's an extremely well-written book that suggests exactly what it seems to suggest. Nothing ever remains the same. Systems eventually deteriorate and become something new, whether we like it or not. Achebe took the title from a line in William Butler Yeats's poem The Second Coming. Another work that always reminds me of Things Fall Apart and Yeats's poem is Ozymandias by Percy by Shelley. The more you look for the idea of things fall apart across literature, the more you'll find it. It's an all too common theme because it's true to life, it's a theme so easily observed around us. Alright, we have now successfully analyzed Brolin's poem. Now you may be wondering, what's so bad about it? If anything, the analysis seemed to suggest there truly is a lot of depth here. Well, it may have seemed that way, but as I performed my initial analysis of the poem, I was also writing some commentary. Let me share with you what I think doesn't work about this poem. As previously stated, poems are clusters of language. A good poem uses its language in unique and interesting ways. That's what poetry is all about, the best words in their best order, as Samuel Taylor Coleridge reportedly said. Almost all of the figurative language in Brolin's work is either cliché or supremely uninteresting. Let me walk you through it. To say that something is etched on someone's face is unoriginal. In fact, the Webster's Dictionary entry for the word etch uses the word almost exactly as Brolin does. A much more interesting word would have been impressed, since the words impress and impression have multiple meanings. There would have been more implied than what the word etch suggests. And that's just one example. On the next line down, the word adolescence is also rather boring. If you look up synonyms for the word adolescence, Google provides juvenescence, which is more unique and even has a certain euphonic ring to it. Similarly, thesaurus.com provides the words greenness, juvenility, and spring, which are all immensely more interesting to me than adolescence. Here, take this little rewrite of Brolin's first two lines. Your face is impressed by spring. By just changing two words, there are already more layers to uncover. Moving on, I actually do like the juxtaposition of the jumping cheekbones and the eyes that slide down. The word jump communicates that the cheekbones are alive unto themselves. It's kind of the only figurative language in this poem that I find worthwhile. Otherwise, in the second line of this second stanza, the term youth-laden is just kind of odd. Like, it's counterintuitive, an oxymoron, and I don't think intentionally. The word laden means to be weighed down with. For Brolin to say that Chalamet's youth weighs him down seems pretty contrary to the poem's overall message. Also, at the beginning of this line, I have to criticize Brolin's use of the words, what are? It reads so awkwardly. Why wouldn't you just write, your cheekbones jump toward youth-laden eyes? Why complicate things like that for no reason? It sounds so clunky as written. Moreover, in the third line of this stanza, the word prominent is so boring and inadequate. If you were describing someone who you thought was beautiful, is prominent the word you'd use to describe their nose? Does that word communicate any sense of adolescence or aesthetics? That said, lips of a certain poetry is not a terrible attempt at what Brolin is going for, and certainly not contrary to his point like the other descriptors mentioned above. The third stanza is just straight up uninspired. The phrase, hold my gaze, is such a cliched piece of figurative language that we hardly even register it as figurative anymore, and the second line, makes me fear my own age, is so ordinary. Surely there's a way to write these two lines in a much more interesting manner. For example, just off the top of my head, you might write, when your gaze devours mine, it tastes my added years of anxiousness at the back of the throat. Ultimately, this stanza is way too explicit. Look, poems don't have to be riddles, but they should leave a reader with something to discover, something to think about. This stanza is just doing the thinking on the audience's behalf. The fourth and final stanza essentially has the exact opposite problem, 
or perhaps the same problem but on the opposite end of the spectrum. It gives the audience nothing to think about because it's too vague. This stanza uses the word something three different times, a word that is so nonspecific and nebulous. In the first line when Brolin says, something in me tells me, first of all, that's cliché, but second of all, what is it inside of you? Give me any specifics, Josh, please, something to consider. As already mentioned, the second line again uses the word something, again to an unspecific mind-numbing end. This is the reason everyone thought the poem was about Timothy Chalamet wanting to have sex with Josh Brolin. These lines are so indefinite that they could legitimately be about anything. And since the poem opened with a description of Chalamet's beauty, that's the only through line to pull to this hazy conclusion. Also, I just have to mention how arbitrary these line breaks are. Sure, none of the line breaks or stanza breaks in this poem seem all that intentional, but here especially. So those are all the reasons I both dislike this poem and think it's poorly written. I don't think it's stimulating or unique or even particularly pleasant to the ears, so what does that suggest about my opinions on whether poetry has to be good, whether it has to justify itself? Well, this might surprise you, but I actually agree with this Redditor who said a poem doesn't have to be anything. There is a place in this world for bad poetry, because even bad poetry will resonate with people. Look no further than Instapoets. I've somewhat notoriously been pretty hard on 21st century poets, but I don't say this enough. If people are reading and writing poetry, that's an overall good thing, even if the quality of the poetry leaves something to be desired. So yes, absolutely, there's a place for purely fun poetry. In this same vein, I would never criticize someone's journal-written stream of consciousness poetry for being bad. Obviously, I'd never say those poems don't have a right to exist. That would be ridiculous. However, I don't think this line of thinking should be used to defend the literary merit of a poem. Just because there's a place in the world for fun, shallow poetry, that doesn't mean we should hold it in the same regard as more deliberate, well-thought-out poetry. And acknowledging all of this, there is something to be said about the quality of a poem and what an audience has to do to access it. To put it in simpler terms, if a poet is going to try and sell their poetry, they need to know how much it's truly worth. I've talked about this before, but just because a poem is therapeutic to write or even fun to craft, that doesn't justify putting it in a book and trying to sell it. This Timothy Chalamet poem by Josh Brolin is reportedly part of a larger book called Dune Exposures by Brolin and cinematographer Greg Frazier. Now, this book is not a poetry book, just a book that has some poetry. In fact, the poetry therein doesn't even seem to be one of the selling points. But if Josh Brolin were to release a poetry book, one would hope the quality of the poetry correlates to the price. Moreover, if someone were to buy Dune Exposures for the poetry, and every poem were like this, I think the purchaser would be pretty disappointed, especially given the book's price. So, is Josh Brolin a good poet? Well, I think it's impossible to answer that question based on just one poem. Word has it that Brolin wrote other poems for his co-stars, such as Zendaya, which will reportedly be revealed at a later date. At that point, we'll have a more complete picture. Until then, we do have this haiku that Brolin shared with Variety. Lie down in the light, as fictional characters watch you from afar. This is worlds more interesting to me than his free verse poem for Chalamet. I think the fact that he consigned himself to a structure here ended up making the poem more intentional and, in effect, better. It's not a perfect haiku by any means, but I think there's more to unpack than in the free verse work. I think the poem presents questions such as, what does it mean to lie down in the light? What does it mean to be fictional? What does it mean to be watched? These aren't questions based on sheer confusion, they're questions that hope to engage with the material in a way that uncovers meaning. In the actor's own analysis of this haiku, he said, it's pointing out the fact that this is not real. But there's nothing more real. The light is real, lying down is real, the sand is real, the experience is real, and yet, it's this great contrasting thing. One thing to note is that Variety described the Chalamet poem as tongue-in-cheek, but that was misleading. There's nothing in the poem itself that indicates a tongue-in-cheek tone to the audience. Brolin used the term tongue-in-cheek to refer to the writing in the book more broadly. As the man himself put it, the writing is very different tonally. Sometimes it's tongue-in-cheek, 
Sometimes it's descriptive, sometimes it's a dialogue, and sometimes it's a poem. And look, I want to re-emphasize my intentions with these poetry criticism videos. I just want people to consider the craft of poetry more deeply. I don't mean to sound like a gatekeeper or to say that people can't enjoy the kind of poetry that I deem bad. That would be silly. I also don't mean to say people like Josh Brolin should stop writing poetry. That would be dumb too. Rupi Kaur, Megan Fox, Josh Brolin, I think they all should write poetry. I think everyone should. But I think if they decide to publish, they should really envelop themselves in time, workshopping, and revision. What did you think of Brolin's poem? Did you like it? Did your interpretation differ from mine? What did you think of this video essay? Please tell me everything. And hey, if you liked this video and regularly enjoy the content I produce here, consider supporting me on Patreon to get benefits like early access to videos, access to the community discord, and priority for audience submission reviews. Speaking of, you can submit your work to me at the link in the description or to my P.O. box. Be sure to follow me on Instagram to see what I'm reading along with the occasional video preview, and follow me on Twitter because I guess that's the YouTuber thing to do. And keep in mind, ultimately, this is a rough draft. <laughs>